I want to invite you to turn with me to Psalm 103 this morning. We are in the midst of a series through the Psalms, or just selected Psalms, where uh, we've titled it Captured, where we are thinking about how the Psalms capture different things and that we experience in life, different emotions, different trials, different, different stuff that we go through just that's common to our everyday experience. We've seen how the Psalms invite us to the big questions of life, of why am I here? Uh, how, am I, uh, how do I live a, a happy life? How am I blessed? We've seen how the Psalms kind of help us in in our powerlessness, when we feel like everything's out of our control. We've, we saw last week and we considered a, a psalm that kind of helps us think through when we're silent, when, when we, don't have any, we, we don't have words to say, and we hold it in, and it, it helps us to see in the reality of, of the grand scheme of things who we are and who God is and allow us to approach him in, in a praiseworthy manner. And this morning we're going to think uh, about a, uh, this particular psalm, a psalm that uh, we've already mentioned a little bit about this morning, a psalm that calls us, invites us to praise, invites us to bless, to glorify God together. And we're going to consider this psalm this morning. So let me read for us Psalm 103. It's a psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, In all places of his dominion, bless the Lord, O my soul. God's word for us this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that as we come to this, your word, that you would, through your spirit, help us to understand it, help us to take it in. And Lord, I pray this morning that you would help us to see you, to see you more clearly to see who you are and what you have done for us in Christ out of the abundance of your love and your mercy and grace that you lavish upon your children. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit might come and be in our midst and that we might understand and know that we might further follow and bless your name. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. I'm not sure how many of you, you walked outside this past Wednesday morning, and if you were like me when you walked outside, it was glorious. It was absolutely wonderful, for, because for the first time that I, in, in recent memory, my memory's kind of short, for the first time in recent memory, I walked outside and I didn't start sweating. And there was this 
this coolness to the air. And there was, there was no humidity in the air. And I'm, I'm not making this up. For those of you that are, are watching online from some other place in the country, we had fall. It started Wednesday morning. It stopped, but it's, it was there for a few days. And I walked outside Wednesday morning and I did this. <sighs> because it's like 60 degrees. And part of me went, as I'm walking to the car, I, I thought this in my head. I went, you know, I forgot what this was like. I, I didn't forget like it's, you know, what it's, what cold is. Like I didn't like, just like, oh, this is different. Like new, I, I, it hasn't happened in so long. And the news told us like it has been since March, since it was this cool, like central Florida, this is crazy to me. It's been since March and I'm like, I just forgot. I forgot what it was like to be cold. I, it's not that I forgot. It's just, I haven't experienced it in a while. But maybe you had another experience this week. Maybe someone in your house kindly asked you, can you turn the dishwasher on before you go to bed? And you forgot. It's not that you had an ex I see the looks that are being given right now. That's awesome. I love standing up here. Um, it's not that you, you haven't experienced it in a long time. You forgot. You got busy doing something else. Watching a show, watching a game, doing something on the internet. You just flat out, like, I, I, I've turned the TV off. I put the computer down. I'm going to bed. There's nothing else happening in the world. You forgot. Oops. Sorry about that. Or maybe you just had one of those weeks. One of those weeks where it just didn't happen right with anything. And you drove home Friday from work or you came home from school and you said to yourself, well, this is a week I want to forget. That's a week that, ugh. Let's just forget that week ever happened. That same word, I've used that same word in three different contexts. The word forget. We can forget things because we haven't experienced them for a while. We can forget things because we're so busy doing something else or some things else that we just don't remember. Or we can forget because it was such a bad something, so painful, or just nothing happened. And you just go, you know, that's just something I'm going to forget. And we just put it out of our minds, hoping not to think about it again. Psalm 103 is going to invite us. It's going to invite those who follow after Jesus to, to remember to not forget, to not forget who he is, to not forget what he has done, to not forget what, what one of the first few verses says is, don't forget his benefits. Don't forget him. One thing I, that I read this week that I've just, it's just been walking around in my head all week is the opposite of praise is forgetfulness. The opposite of praise, what this psalm invites us to, what this psalm calls us to, it sits in the midst of a bunch of other psalms that invite us, call us. That this is why God made us. God made you and I to praise him to bring him glory, to make much of him. And yet, the opposite of that is forgetfulness, according to this author. And so we're invited to not forget. Maybe we've forgotten God this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and, and God is just someone that you haven't experienced in a long time. Maybe you've just forgotten him. 
Or maybe you just got busy with life. You got busy with work and raising a family and all of these other things that happen and take place and you've just, you just forgot. Or perhaps you've had an experience with God in the past where you've just said, you know what? I'm just gonna put that out of my mind. I'm gonna put him in the worship of him. I'm just gonna put him over there. And I'm gonna come and I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna smile and I'm gonna put on the happy face and everything, I'm gonna say everything is fine. But in reality, I've just kind of put God over there and not remembering him. If, if you resonate with any of those, I wanna invite you in, invite you in to this Psalm to see why it is, who it is that we, we worship, who it is that we come and we sing to, who we pray to, who we sing and bless his holy name. And I'm gonna invite us to do that in, with three points this morning, not six like we had last week, we'll just have three. We're gonna think about who God is, what he has done, and what he gives. Who he is, what he's done, and what he gives. Who he is. The psalm, like I said, it invites us to bless him, to bless his holy name. Who is this God? He is one who is holy. It's his character, it's his nature. It's, it's not just like what he does, it's who he is is. It's his character. It's, his, it's part of his attributes. And the Psalm's not going to go through all of the character or all the attributes of God, but it's going to pull out a few like this one, like that God is holy. Look at with me at verse eight. It says, the Lord is merciful and gracious. He is holy. He is perfect in every way. There is no corruption. There is no sin. He's also merciful and he's gracious. He does not give to us the things that we deserve. He gives to us the things that we do not deserve. He's merciful. He is gracious to us. It's part of his character. It's not just what he does, but what he does flows out of that part of his character. It flows out of that part of his nature. It's who he is. The Psalm, it, it says he's holy. It says he is merciful. It says he is gracious. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love. He is compassionate. Verse 13, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. His nature is one of compassion. He's merciful, he's gracious, he's holy, he is compassionate. He doesn't look down upon us from his throne in heaven where everything is, is perfect and he's got all his angels singing and praising and look down on us and go, oh man, those poor people. He looks at us with compassion. He looks at us with sympathy and concern for the pain and the suffering that we have brought into his world. It's who he is, it's his character, it's his nature, and he is abounding in steadfast love. And out of all of those things, everything else follows. And so the psalm is inviting us to come and to worship him for who he is. And you, we, might, we might go past that really, really quickly. I know I often do. I often just kind of go, okay, yeah, I've got that. I, I get it. Like God is holy. He's different than me. I can't really even comprehend who he is, but I, I know he's holy and I, I, he's been merciful and gracious to me. And we run through that so quickly because we want to get to the, the second point of the sermon. And that's what he gives. It's what he's done. But if we do that too quickly, we begin to think and to use God for who he is to get what we want. Let me explain using a, an illustration from the Bible, from Jesus in John chapter six. Jesus, he's fed lots and lots of people. 
not just like he fed them a little bit, like they got, you know, they had the rumble going on in the stomach and he gave them just a couple of pieces just to kind of tide them over. He fed them so that they were so full, they're like lying on the ground going, oh, that was good. Like they're in a food coma because they ate so much. It's like Thanksgiving dinner where you're just going, okay, I'll do one more pound of turkey. And you, you're just, you're in pain. Like, these people, thousands of them have been fed by Jesus. And so he goes, Jesus, he goes to the other side of this lake. And the people who he fed follow after him. And the next day they show up and they kind of come up to Jesus and go, hey, Jesus, what you doing today? We're hungry again. And he says, why are you here? Well, you, you fed us last night and we were in a food coma and that was great. Can you do that again? And Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Here's who I am. One of the seven I am statements in the book of John. He's, he's declared, this is my nature. This is my character. Who am I? I'm the bread of life. And the, as Jesus is talking, in John chapter 6, it's a really long chapter. It's just discord that Jesus is having with these folks. And after a while, they're kind of, they kind of go, all right, I, I don't think he's going to feed us. And they leave. And they all walk away. Because what God invites us to is to himself. And Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, so you guys going to leave me too now? And Peter, spokesman of the group, Peter says, where else could we go? You have the words of eternal life. We're, you're, the, you're the king of kings. You are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You are God made flesh. And they follow because of who he is. And we are invited to follow God and to know him for who he is. To come and to, to, to praise and to worship and to get to know his character. To get to know his attributes. To get to know that in his heart of his being of who he is, that he is merciful. That he is gracious. That he is holy. That he is loving. That he hates sin that his anger burns at sin and wickedness and the fallenness of this world because he is holy. And so we're invited to come to worship him and to get to know him for him, to know him for who he is. And for, for so many of us, probably myself included, it's one of those things that we, we wrestle with of just wanting to, to, know, to know God for what he's done for us. When he invites us into a fuller picture of saying, come and know me for me. Get to know me for who I am, for what my attributes are. But at the same time, we also praise him for what he's done. The Psalm brings that out to us. We praise him, we bless his name for all that he has done. If you look with, with me at verse 11, it says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. His love for us is immense. As high as the heavens are above the earth. That's, that, you gotta think back to the time where there, like, there was no rockets, there was no NASA, we, you know, we didn't shoot, you know, there's no SpaceX shooting rockets up like every other day into space. We're like, we know how high the heavens, this is a, he said, this is infinite. This is as high as the heavens are above the earth. It's unmeasurable. God's love for us. And here, out of that character of who he is, out of his love, here's what he has done for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions 
from us. As far as the east is from the west. That's another expression, like we don't use that very often or ever perhaps, but I've, I've been thinking about this. Some of you have been traveling to the other side of the planet recently, and you've gone a long, long way in your travels. And when you take off on an airplane and you travel, say you're going to travel to the west, you actually never stop going west. You ever think about that? One of those things that you, that this keeps me up at night. Like I just, you're just thinking about this. And you're like, you know, if I travel west, will I ever go east? No. But if I go north, eventually I'll go south. That is true. That's why the psalmist doesn't use that idea. But if you go east or you go west, you will actually never stop going that direction. And so when it says that he has separated us from our sins as far as the east is from the west, it's infinite. Your sin has been separated from you as far as the east is from the west. And so the question you might be like, well, where is it then? It's gone from you. It has been dealt with. It has been forgiven. This, this psalm, it's a, it's a psalm of praise. It's a psalm of worship. It's a psalm that actually points us to the Messiah. It points us to Jesus. Because Jesus is going to come and he will accomplish what this psalm is praising God for. They were so confident of that fact that they would say, God, here is what you have done. There is coming a day. Genesis 3.15 has proclaimed it, where you will crush the head of the serpent, where you will forgive your people of all of our sin, and it will be separated from us so that it's no longer attached to our name. It's no longer ours. God has taken care of it through the death of Christ. He will take our sin and the wrath that's due to us. Because remember, God is holy. He can't have anything to do with sin. And the wages of our sin, the Bible says, is death. What comes from that sin is death. And he will take that and he will make him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. He has separated our sin, our iniquity from us. And what the psalm does here is it brings us into the presence of a holy God and we see our sin and our need for a savior. We see our, our need for him, for our sin to be dealt with. And he says, here is how your sin has been dealt with. Here is what I will do for you out of who I am, out of my grace, out of my mercy, out of my love, out of holiness. Here is what I will do. I will send one who will take away your sin. And he knows us. He knows us. And what he has done is he has brought about that gospel at that perfect time where he is, is working in us to make us more and more like Jesus. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. He knows our days are, are short. They're like the grass, the flower of the field, the wind passes over it. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. The Lord is with those who fear him and what he has done for us in Christ. He, he is growing us. He is molding us and he is shaping us. I was, was having a conversation with a few of the, the folks on our staff this week and Jeffrey uh, Hoy, who was up here leading us in worship, the, the one playing the guitar. It was his birthday yesterday, so wish him a happy birthday after the service. Um, Jeffrey, we were, we were talking, he's got a, a baby boy, Logan. Logan's two months old, uh, almost two months or so. And, and I was like, you know, have you started, I asked him, I was like, have you started teaching Logan how to drive? He's like, you know, Logan right now, Logan's working on like big things, like holding his head up on his own. 
he's, he's working on like motor reflexes and like sitting up. But if we grow older, we, we mature, we get bigger, we get stronger, we, we work on different things, we learn different things. And as a father to his children, God knows us. He knows what he is doing. He is growing us. He, is gro- he knows that some of us in this room, we are spiritual infants. We have just come to faith in the last few days, weeks, and months. And we rejoice at that. And that's a wonderful, awesome thing. And yet we are still, we're new in this and we're still trying to figure it out. And in some way, we're just trying to hold our head up. God has compassion on you. As a father has compassion on his children, it's what he's doing. And others, we have been in the faith for decades now. And God is working in our lives in the same way, in different ways perhaps, growing us, showing us our sin, bringing us back to the foot of the cross where the gospel is applied again and again and again. It's what God has done for us. And here is what he, here's what he gives. It's an invitation to bless. Look back with me at, at verse uh, one through five or so. And then we're gonna look at verses 20 and 22. It's, it's a bookend of this psalm. The psalm, it begins with this, with this invitation. Bless the Lord with, oh my soul, everything that's within me, bless his holy name. Don't forget his benefits. What are those benefits? Here's what he gives. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And so bless him. All the angels, the mighty ones who do his word, who obey the voice of his word, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Forget not his benefits. Here is what comes with this great truth of the gospel of what God has done for us. It, it invites us in to him to praise him for who he is and what he's done when we see the benefits that he's given to us. And he says, I've, I've forgiven all your iniquity, all of your sin, all of the things that you have done wrong, all of the times you haven't done what is right. He has forgiven in Christ who heals all your diseases. And when I come to that one, I hit the brakes and go, wait a second. That... You, you, you heal all my diseases. You, you didn't heal my friend. You didn't heal my friend's child. You didn't heal my dad. You didn't heal. What is this true? Now I begin to go, oh, okay. Now the, maybe, maybe this is just all made up. A couple of, couple of things. One as we think about that, that phrase, one's a grammatical thing and the other is a, an idea of maybe we have it mixed up in our heads. One, the grammatical piece of that, this, uh, I was reading that this phrase, heals all your diseases, is often used in the Old Testament as a metaphor for adversities and setbacks. It's not necessarily disease, not necessarily speaking of like, oh, you had cancer and it, you know, it, it's been healed all of a sudden. But all of the adversities, all of the setbacks that come, that God in his work as a compassionate father is actually using those things for our good to make us more and more like him. More like his character, more like his nature as the gospel is applied. So that's one, that's a grammatical possibility. The other is maybe we, we have it wrong when we think about God healing our disease that maybe we just expect him to do it in the here and now, but that ultimately he heals all of our disease, all of our adversities, maybe not the way that we want, but the way that he has chosen, where one day, someday he is making all things new, where all adversity, where all disease, where all trials, where all strife, it will all be done away with. You see, God, heals sometimes in ways that, that, that we wouldn't pick but are better. 
He heals all of our disease. He takes our adversity and its setbacks and he redeems them for himself. And he takes us out of the pit. He takes us from living on the trash heap. And he says, that's where you were? Here's a crown. Here's the royal gowns. Come live in my house. You're part of the family now. What an amazing benefit that we have. What an amazing God that we have. It says, here's who I am. He reveals himself to us. Here's what I have done. And here's what comes along with that. That you're not just out there somewhere, but you're invited into my presence. You're invited to get to know me and to learn about how I, how I tick, how I think, how I, how I move and what I do. He invites us into that. And this is for a people who are rebellious against God. This is for you and for me. These words, particularly in this, this, these first few verses, actually echo how God reveals himself to Moses at one point in the history of Israel. If you have, if you have your Bible with you, uh, Exodus chapter 34, I'm not gonna read the, the whole chapter, but Exodus chapter 34, uh, I'll just, here's the story. Very, I mean, the, the cliff notes, the spark notes, like pff, Reader's Digest version of the story really, really quick. God has brought his people who he has made a covenant with and said, you're my people. I'm your God, you're my people. They've been in slavery for hundreds of years. He has now delivered them out of his love and grace and mercy. He has delivered them out of slavery. He has revealed himself to them. And he has this one guy named Moses who's the leader of this whole group. And Moses has gone up on this mountain and God is there on that mountain speaking to Moses and he gives Moses the 10 commandments. We've probably all heard of the 10 commandments. Even if you've never been to church, you've heard the 10 commandments before. So here's, Moses is up on the mountain. He's doing, he's hanging out with God. The people are down in the valley and they're getting bored. And they go, you know what? Let's do this today. Everybody bring your earrings, nose rings, belly rings, and all this jewelry that you have, and we're gonna melt it down. And they melt it down and they make a little cow. And they say, here is our God. And they start worshiping this little cow that they've made out of their earrings, nose rings, and everything else. And Moses comes down from the mountain and sees them the people that God has called out, the people that God has made his covenant with and worshiping this thing. And he's furious. He breaks the tablets that the 10 commandments are written on. Now Moses in Exodus 34, he's going back up the mountain to get a, you know, the second copy of the 10 commandments. And here's what it says in verse four. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, this is God speaking of himself. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head to the earth and worshiped. And he said, now this is Moses speaking, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. And he, that is God, said, Behold, I am making a covenant before you and these people. In the midst of their rebellion, in the midst of their going, you know, this has taken too long. Let's just forget about this God who has saved us. And they worshiped other things. 
God comes and he reveals himself once again. He reveals who he is. That this psalm harkens back to that time where they rebelled, where they forgot, where they ran away from God and worshiped other things and where God revealed himself. And he says, come now, come and know me, worship me. Because we, like those Israelites wandering around in the desert, we're stiff-necked people too. Every single one of us, myself included, we're stiff-necked people who forget. Sometimes we forget because we're busy. Sometimes we forget because we haven't experienced him in a long time. And sometimes we forget because we've just pushed him aside. And he welcomes us all to come, to come and remember, to bless his name, to know him for who he is, first and foremost. And so I want to invite you in the, the week that lies ahead and whatever you have that's going on in the busyness or the slowness or the, the craziness or the stress or the anxiety or whatever it is that you have that you're looking forward to or not looking forward to in the week ahead, come and see. Come and see God for who he is. Take a deep, deep gaze into his soul, into his character, into his nature. Go into the word, go into the Psalms and read it and say, God, would you show me who you are? Not just let me focus on what you've done, not just on the benefits that you give, which are wonderful, awesome things, but I'm coming to you because you have done those awesome, wonderful things. And I want to know you, to know you more, not just what you give, but who you are. May that be true of all of us in the days that lie ahead, that we would be a people who would gaze deeply into the heart of our holy God. Let me pray for us. Father, we're so easily distracted. I know my heart is, I know uh, I'm not unique. Maybe, maybe many of us here in this room, we're so easily distracted by the things of life. And so we pray that you would help us in the days that lie ahead, that our gaze might be fixed upon you, that we might come and behold you, not just what you've done, as awesome and wonderful and gracious and merciful as that is, but Lord, may we behold you so that we might know you, and that our lives might be changed as we come to know you more. And so Lord, I pray that you would help us to see you and that out of that, we might praise and worship and bless your holy name. We pray for Jesus' sake, for his glory, for his fame, and for his praise. Amen.